Welcome to the Mindset Game Podcast. I'm Varid Kogan, and I am delighted to introduce you to Dan Miller. Dan is a multiple award-winning, internationally renowned nutrition and fitness expert, developing health and wellness programs for all walks of life, from executives to professional fighters and everyone in between. Dan is also a former Guinness World Endurance Record holder, has completed three master's degrees and speaks to thousands of executives worldwide each year. In fact, he was awarded the Vistage International Speaker of the Year Award in 2018, which is really amazing. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with Vistage, it's a peer advisory organization that supports CEOs and key executives all around the world. Dan and I are both speakers with Vistage. That's how we connected. And I'm just delighted to, to have Dan with us. He's a uh, certified nutrition professional, an adventurer, a scientist, author, scuba diver, martial artist, athlete, father, husband, we can go on and on. Um, and what I'm really excited about is that Dan's gonna show us how nature intended the human animal to live longer, better, and with less disease. So Dan, welcome. Thank you so much for being here with us today. I appreciate you. I just wanna let everyone watching and listening know that this is not a fake background. That's my backyard. So that, that is real. That's a real ray of sunshine coming out over the camera there. <laughs> and if the birds screaming and the squirrels screaming and the cicadas chirping, that's all happening right back there, so. I love it. I, mean, I got to see a couple of beautiful dogs, you know, on there on that swing with you as well. And that was really cool. So thank you for um, kind of having this conversation with us today. It is such an important conversation these days. I mean, I know you hear this. I hear this. Anybody who's in this field has he heard that there is a, a major issue with mental well-being, with health these days. People are feeling lonely. They are really struggling. We see a lot more uh, physical symptoms showing up. Um, let's dive right into this. Uh, what what do you want the listeners, the viewers to get from our conversation? If we fast forward to the end, what's the main message you need them to know? Well, if we got 12 hours together, <laughs> I want them to get a bunch of information that they can go use to live a longer, healthier life. We don't have 12 hours together. So uh, I want them to get a perspective that they may not have considered before. <clears throat> and use that perspective to do something better. Because I think, you know, you can look around, you'll see this. And, and if somebody doesn't look around and see this, they just need to leave their neighborhood a little bit more often. But we are accepting mediocrity as normal in everything that we do, in our health, in our jobs, in our, in our attitude towards things. It's just meh. That's the attitude of everything and everyone right now. And it's really sad because we were built in, and we were designed for more than that. Awesome. So so let's go even deeper. What is that perspective? So you've shared kind of a nutshell of it, but what are some of those key things that people need to know in order to, to experience their best, healthiest life? Well, I'll, I'll go into the main one because in, in, you know, when I've been studying and reading and, and, and interviewing and talking to uh, folks in the longevity field for the last uh, almost a decade, uh, I've read nearly 800 books, thousands of scientific studies on, on the stuff that I talk about to live a longer life. I find that there's a, one little lost secret that no one talks about. And no one talks about it because there's no profit to be made once I say what this thing is. There's nothing else to sell you. There's nothing to buy. You just have to go do this thing. So it's an action that we can take, or at least a perspective we can take and ask ourselves, are we are we doing enough? And, and I'll go back. I want to go back because what humans have forgotten is that we are an animal. I mean, earlier before we started the recording, I had two of the three German shepherds on the couch with me here outside. And and we're so closely related to those animals because for millions of years of our evolutionary past, we lived alongside of them. Hey, dogs have been part of our life for a very, very long time. And I think what humans forgot, in, and I don't know where we forgot this, somewhere along the way, maybe it was when food became almost always there in, in this society anyways. I think we forgot that we are an animal, that we used to live outside, that that's where we were designed, or if we want to use strict Darwinian evolution, that's where we evolved to be. And that was two and a half million years of our past. 
And if we look at where we're at now, the statistic, and you can find this pretty easy by pulling up Dr. Google, right? Just look, go to the Google machines and, and they'll tell you. The average American spends five hours a week outdoors. So we're always in a cage. And it's a temperature controlled cage. It's 70 and soft in there all the time. And then when we leave that cage, we go to a smaller cage that goes 80 miles an hour rolling down the highway made out of metal and glass. And we cruise Facebook while we're in there. Uh, so we go from one cage to another cage to the home cage uh, where we finally got in our families. And we've forgotten that if we did that to any other animal, it's not going to end well for them. So I think the biggest thing I want people to take home is you're an animal and you belong outside. And if you want to feel better, act better, do better and be better, spend more time out there with the people who love and you're there for. Go outside more. And hey, I'm sitting in Eden Prairie, Minnesota right now. I get it. Winter sucks. Go outside more anyway. That's where all the food is. So th that's the big message. And that's the message when I do my three hour programs. That's the message when I do my hour and a half keynotes is we were programmed as an animal to live outside. If we're going to live in a cage, we still have to take some of these actions that we would have taken if we were outside. I think that's the biggest thing we've forgotten. One of I, them. <laughs> thank you. And I, I, I agree with you. And, you know, one of the guests that we had on the show is a gentleman called Clint Ober, uh, who kind of uh, started the earthing or grounding uh, revolution. And he too speaks about being outside, being, you know, with nature, literally feet on the ground. Um, and so what about those people that are listening and saying, okay, I get you, Dan, but I mean, have you seen my calendar? Who has time to be outside, right? How can I accomplish all these things? So, I mean, that's the biggest limiting belief I hear uh, when it regards to like, in regards to health and fitness. So just don't have the time, not enough time. What, what do you say to that? Well, I tell them they're right because that's how the brain works, right? Most of the brain is absolutely dumb. It has no idea what reality is and believes whatever you tell it. And that percentage is, is a, a roughly 88% of the brain just doesn't know what reality is. It's one of the reasons in science why placebo works. I mean, I spent part of my career with a pharmaceutical company, and and you you learn quite a quite a bit of really interesting things when you're behind the giant veil of pharmaceuticals and, and learning from them. And one of those things is almost a thousand drugs. I think it's over a thousand drugs is the st statistic today. Uh, don't get FDA approval because they can't beat the nothing pill. So there are literal, actual, active molecules in science that we give to people that can't outperform a lie that a doctor told them. And, and that's just fascinating to me. So the brain believes what we tell it. And when somebody says, I don't have time, I tell them you're right, because you will never not make that true because that is your belief system in your, your body and your brain and all of your actions will match that because that is your reality. So you'll make that true. And then you'll say, see, I don't have enough time. And we teach the same thing to kids. If you say the word can't, you are always right. I can't do this. You're right. You can't. So stop trying. The alternative to that is to reframe and look at just a, a guy like me. Like I, I came from nothing and, and I, I still look at the fact that I'm still on my way somewhere. If I have the time, you have the time. The excuses are nonsense because if I turn the power off, if I just shut the grid down, we're one solar flare away from doing this anyway, right? One event. Grid is gone, power's off, no internet, no power. It's going to be a matter of months and we're all going to be living outside anyway with no excuses, right? So if, if nothing else, I tell people prepare for that eventuality because maybe that happens in your lifetime, maybe not. We're due for one. So, and I'm not doom and gloom about it. I just like, look, quit making the excuses. If you're working from home, find a way to get a standing desk outside. Your in internet will reach out there. I'm sure of it. Find a way to do something, even if it's just 10 more minutes a day. The, the rays of sunlight that we get out here, even the indirect ones, I'm not indirect sunlight. I have a little bit of it shining on me, but I'm not indirect sunlight all day. We feel better, act better, do better, sleep better. We're more productive. We're happier when we just go outside. And, and if you want to have your feet on the ground, great. If you don't, just get out there. Do something. And the excuses are ridiculous. I don't have time to go outside. That doesn't make any sense to me. Let, we have to find a way.
get up 15 minutes earlier and spend 15 minutes outside before you go to work. And I, I'm with you. It really is a decision. And like everybody listening, once they make a decision and they commit to it, they find a way to, to make it happen. Uh, they reprogram their thoughts. That is possible. We know that is. So, so going outside, right, breathing that fresh air, being in that direct or indirect sunlight. What else? Yeah, well, I mean, so we we just have to do all of the other actions like that. But it starts with that mindset shift that I'm an animal. What would an animal do if it lived outside right now? One of the things I want to remind people is this is the biggest factor when it comes to how do I live a longer life with less disease is when humans were outside. If we just look at what we are and I'm going to I'm going to call the the listeners and the, and the viewers here are, are pathetic because because we are humans are pathetically weak. We're painfully slow. Our night vision sucks. Our camouflage is even worse than our night vision. Our claws are useless. Like when I go back out here in the woods alone, I'm in trouble. I am nothing more. And so are you, anyone listening. You're nothing more than middle of the food chain bear food when you go back outside. That's just how it is. That's how it's been for millions of years. So what we look at, how did humans get successful enough? to get buildings and cars and, and the internet. And why don't bears have those things? <laughs> I, I was in traffic the other day, imagining if bears were in traffic with me, how, how just horrible that would be, right? Maybe it's because I have one of these and bears don't. Maybe it's because our prefrontal cortex is a little bigger and we're able to utilize technology, but that's not the driving force that kept keeps us safe outside. The driving force that's kept humans safe outside for two and a half million years is the fact that we were in a group of people, not alone. We were never outside. That was the most dangerous thing that could happen to you is that you found yourself outside without a tribe around you. That's one of the reasons why people fear speaking in public so much or fear getting on a podcast and talking is because in our primal past, if you were talking to a group of people, you were most likely pleading to stay in the group so that they didn't kick you out because you knew what would happen if they kicked you out. All right. So those groups, it turns out, were about 150 people large. Uh, when the group got bigger than that, it would tend to split off into smaller groups that would grow to about 150. And then those would do the same thing. And, and Robin Dunbar is famous for discovering that and theorizing that and, and being able to show that. Uh, and that's why there's a thing called Dunbar's number today, is that for a couple million years of evolution, we had about 150 people in our immediate vicinity. And this is where the, the secrets to longevity and I would argue the secrets to mental health come in. For two and a half million years, there were 150 people that needed you, they valued you, they loved you, and you were vitally important to their survival. Those are the most four most important words I talk about when I talk about longevity. Before I talk about diet, before I talk about uh, saunas and, and water intake, I talk about being needed, valued, loved, and important by a tribe of people much, much bigger than your immediate family. And if you can do that, you will tend to live longer with less disease. The rest of the stuff tends to fall more in place as it should if we feel every morning when we wake up needed, valued, loved, and important by a group bigger than us, that we have a mission and a passion and a purpose, like I have to get up, not just to pay taxes and die, but I have to get up because people need me. So for two and a half million years, social pressure worked. And now we're told, don't ever put social pressure on people. It's not fair. Okay, social pressure is what kept us alive and got us here today and now we don't use it. We went from living in a group of 150 people that held us accountable to stand up and do uh, our very best. Now the average American has less than eight friends. And they go to a place for eight or nine hours a day that they don't really want to be at. And in the prevailing mentality is do just barely enough work not to get fired. You don't want to do too much. That, that's the mentality we've established in most of our modern society. I'm not saying everyone is like that this this. There's too many people on the planet to say that it works for all of us that way because it doesn't. But for most people, that's the way it is. We're animals stuck in cages. We went from big tribal support groups. 150 people would pick us up if we had a bad day. And now nobody does in most cases for most Americans. If they're having a bad day, they just have to do it alone. That's not what we were designed to do. And what we see if we did what we're doing to humans to any other animal 
we see anxiety, depression, and self-harm ramp up before obesity and cancer and, and other diseases. We see the mental health disorder start first if we lock a deer in a cage away from its support network, put it under all day stress. Like imagine a, be a deer worrying about its credit score all day long, right? And if its boss is going to fire it from being a deer. And then we give them free access to sugar and drugs. And we expect this to all work out okay. And then when you fail, you're told it's your willpower that sucks. Because you're an animal. You're nothing more than a caged animal who's doing stuff they weren't designed to do. Counting calories, right? Trying to trying to make sure I go to the gym. I always tell kids, I, I like to to dumb things down to the point where I could talk to a, you know, a 10 or 12 year old about this. And I'm like, you ever see a lion doing CrossFit? <laughs> like, no, they're not designed for that. Nor humans. Are, we are, we're designed to move like that, but only to get our food. Right. So now you're told if you're not going to the gym and you're not eating right, and you're not sleeping right. It's you. That's the failure when it might be your environment that's causing this. And it may even be bigger than that. It may be your reaction to your environment that's causing this is because we forgot some stuff, some old stuff, the programming that's still running the machine is get outside more and do the stuff you do out there and make sure you have a giant tribal support network. So when I talk about the secrets to living a long life, that's the first one. That's the big one. That's the most important one is make sure you are needed, valued, loved, and important by a giant group bigger than yourself and your immediate family. Important principles and true principles. We know this, right? It's timeless. That's how we've survived. And my mind is going to those individuals, again, that are hearing this and saying, it makes perfect sense, Dan, but you know what? You don't know my life. Uh, it kind of is survival and I don't have time to go outside or I, you know, have tried being with people and I don't really have the social skills or whatever is going on, especially these days with the younger ones being, you know, with technology a lot and not really having that same connection that perhaps you and I had when we were younger and building those those skills to have that safety, being in a tribe, so to speak. Yeah. So so what what do we do about that? Yeah, that's a, it's a tough question. I mean, when when I go back to my childhood, I was beat up and picked on because I was a skinny, nerdy kid. You know, I grew up in North Dakota as the skinny, nerdy kid, I, and I was beat up and picked on. How how do you think the social skills are going to be for a person like that? At 12 years old, I enrolled in a martial arts program, and that changed my life forever. I've been studying and training and teaching martial arts since I was 12 years old. I'm 51. Uh, that It changes a lot of things when we change the environment. We just have to find the thing, right? I'm a socially anxious introvert who does public speaking for a living. And, and people go, you're you're not they're like, yeah, check me out in the airport once. You'll know exactly because you're going to think I'm kind of a jerk if you see me in the airport because I'm head down, eyes down, music on. I don't want to talk to people. It's just not my thing. But I do this. This is my actual job. I, can, I can, A lot of people pay me to do this. And it's not it doesn't energize me. It drains the heck out of me because that's not really me. It is, but it's not really me is I want to be alone doing stuff out in the yard with the dogs and maybe a couple of close friends around me. But my mission that I found, it took me 42 years to figure this out. We're not going to do it right away. My, I turned my job into my passion, which was helping people not die. And, and it makes a lot of sense for me to do what I do now. So I get up every morning so people don't die like my father and my mother, who died really early. My dad died at 56. My mom died at 74. I mean, that's really early for, for them to die. They both died of cancers that were preventable. Their lifestyle caused their, their imminent death. So my mission now gets me, drives me to get out of bed. It's not because I really love hanging around with big groups of strangers. It's because I feel that that's needed in our society. And I have the ability to deliver a message. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. And I'm grateful that you do. And I'm grateful that you're delivering it with us today. So yeah. let's get into some some specifics. How do we do this? Yeah. Well, the first thing we have to change our mindset and remember what we are. So if we can just remember, I'm an animal. I'm no different than my dog, right? You saw two of my German shepherds. If I were to put my dog back in nature, it it's not stressed out very often. Animals just aren't. I ask people all the time, how do you feel when you're fishing outside? And most people, if they're giving me one word answer, say, I feel pretty good. Yeah, that's the natural state of humans is we should feel pretty good most of the time. 
So we have to adjust our mindset and realize that the stress that we say is inevitable in modern society is killing us. It's the number one problem we have. So to manage or what I tell people to eliminate that is we would do the same thing. We treat the stress like we would if we had stress in nature. We have to treat it by the same rules because it's the same system turning on. When I'm stressed about money or my credit score or a meeting coming up or my boss putting up too much uh, time pressure on me or whatever that is, when I'm stressed about not being able to pay the rent, my body is turning on a primal system called fight or flight that used to be only reserved for bears, bears and lions and snakes. I turn fight or flight on. I move out of that situation very quickly, right? Maybe I push in my slowest friend and walk away because you'll never outrun those bears anyway. So learn to learn to hike in nature with slow people. Uh, I have to do something to remove myself from that situation or I die. We're told in our society that, yeah, that's just normal. Everyone's got stress. But the reality is, if we look at the statistics in the United States, the average American sits in some form of stress for 10 to 12 hours a day. So I tell people, imagine a bear chasing you for 10 hours a day and thinking that's normal. That's not normal. You got to do something about that bear. Yeah, you can run away temporarily, but the bear's coming back. We have to start turning and facing these things that are stressing us out. But before we do that, we have to remind ourselves, look, <laughs> chances are if you're watching this, you're pretty safe most of the time. Most people that I deal with really don't have true life-threatening danger in their lives most of the time. Okay, I'm not saying they don't. I'm not saying they wouldn't have had it if they were uh, you know, a former soldier and they came back for more. Um, I'm not saying that doesn't happen. I'm saying right now, if you're watching this or listening to this, you're probably pretty darn safe. So what do you need fight or flight for if you're safe? And it's turning on because your brain, I'll remind people, your brain is kind of dumb. So when you're stressed about money, it thinks you're under bear attack and it turns on the same hormones. And that's why if you look at the statistics for this, stress uh, accounts for 70% of every doctor visit in the United States. And that's a staggering statistic. And it's an easy one to find. You can even find numbers just on a quick Google search from very reputable organizations saying it's closer to 90% of every doctor visit is stress related. My problem with that is, are we all living in an environment that sucks that bad? Or is it our reaction to that environment that's causing the stress? Is it our inability to handle the situations we find ourselves in daily that causes this? Where does stress come from? That's the first thing we address is where in your life is it coming from? And is it the thing that's causing the stress or is it your ability to handle the thing because you're not educated enough, because you didn't ask for enough tribal support? Why is the thing a stress for you and not for me? Because I don't really have stress. I have stuff that pops up that I have to deal with. Tribal support and education helps me deal with those things. So that's the first thing we address before we talk about the next thing, which is to staying in bed longer. <laughs> cool. Thank you. So let's talk about the next thing, staying yeah, in the, bed longer. Yeah. And I kind of stack these in order because if, if I don't deal with your stress and attack that head on, uh, you will overeat. Uh, we know that stressed out people don't eat salads. They eat bags of M&Ms for no reason, and they don't understand why. So we know that there's going to be a problem there uh, with eating. We know that you're going to lose sleep if you don't attack your stress. We know that if you lose sleep, you're not going to be uh, energized enough to go exercise. So we have to kind of stack these on top of one another and address the biggest one first. After we're done with stress, we've taught you to meditate. We've taught you a couple of techniques to eliminate those bear threats, maybe gotten you some education in your biggest stresses so that you can uh, have a better relationship with those things. Then we go, how long are you staying in bed? Are you getting a good eight hours? That number hasn't changed since grandpa told you, get a good eight hours. That's the same. Scientists are still telling us it's eight hours. It's somewhere between seven and nine in a cold, dark room not having all of the blue light exposure right before you go to bed. That's very, very important. So we clean up the sleep environment. We create some, some new habits around sleep hygiene. We make sure you're scheduling at least seven, uh, if not sometimes nine hours in bed, sleeping on a flat slab, not cruising Facebook, not checking emails, but just chilling out and letting your body recover and rest and clean up and repair. Then we start talking about how, 
how much water you're drinking and and and, and what water means versus uh, you know Gatorade or soda. Awesome. So, how much water should we be drinking? We hear well, all kinds of things. It's so funny because we're like, well, this is a fluid. It's got to count for something. And But there's so many drugs in our fluid that some of those drugs dehydrate us, right? Like when we're drinking coffee, which I drink. I'm not a don't ever drink coffee person. I'm like, that caffeine is dehydrating me. That shouldn't be my first beverage in the morning. I'm trying to hydrate after eight hours of of being unconscious. So water should be our first beverage. You can interject a little bit of caffeinated beverages in there if you choose to, but it should be primarily water. And the health officials in most other countries say three liters of water a day is a very good place to kind of settle as an average. Hey, now I'm 155 pounds soaking wet. It's not, I'm not a very big dude. Uh, one of my buddies that I just bumped into the other day, 240 pounds, solid muscle. He's probably going to need more water than me, right? He's 90 pounds heavier. So we kind of look at this based on who we are and what we're doing. And But it should be roughly three liters, even if we're not very active. Because metabolically speaking, water is going to speed up our metabolic rate and allow us to digest better, give us more energy. It turns out our mitochondria that make our energy for us, they need hydrogen and oxygen. They need those two molecules to make energy. Uh, and water is a really good place to find both of those in an easy to deliver liquid mechanism that goes right into the cell if you have enough salt and magnesium in it. So uh, three liters of water a day, and then don't count the coffee, don't count the alcohol, and don't count the stuff with more than 10 grams of sugar in it. So if you're drinking more than 10 grams of sugar, you are causing or potentially causing some major, major problems for your liver and your pancreas. So we just want to avoid those. And if we are doing something like a soda or a, a venti Starbucks Frappuccino with 90 grams of sugar in it, we just don't count that beverage. I would say we don't do that one every day anyway, because 90 grams of sugar is not going to end well over the next uh, five years for someone. But uh, we do the best we can try to get the three liters in there. And then what we find ourselves doing when we're properly hydrated is naturally eating fewer calories. A lot of folks think they're they're hungry when they're actually indeed just thirsty. And I've seen it, there's a brilliant physician. His name is far too long. It's literally this long for me to pronounce. But uh, he wrote a book called Your Body's Many Cries for Water. Yes. And he's uh, I'm sure you've heard of this book. Fantastic book. But he talks about uh, patients that would come into his clinical practice with high blood pressure. And he would just say, all right, just hang out here. Drink these two glasses of water. I'll be right back in. And then they'd retest it 20 minutes later after drinking two eight ounce glasses of water, which is in today's society, one plastic bottle and their blood pressure would be textbook normal. So these folks had high blood pressure because they were nothing more than dehydrated. And it's not profitable to talk about this in this country. So you're not hearing the message. You're not hearing this when you turn on the TV, drink more water. It's free. It's right out of the tap. Right. I, and some people argue that water is not that healthy. Tap water is healthier than the stuff I can drink out of this slimy pond in my backyard. So I'll take it any day of the week, you guys. Filtered water, just regular city water is one of those technologies that we've forgotten keeps us alive because the number one of the number two killers in undeveloped nations is diarrhea from dirty water. And we've forgotten how safe our water is in this country and told don't ever drink tap water, which I agree we can do better, but Man, that's a good start if you can't afford bottled water or, you know, you're looking at Voss and Fiji water at $6 a, a bottle going, no way, that's ridiculous. I'll get the soda for a dollar. Uh, how about you get the stuff out of your tap for zero dollars? It's, it's re very, very easy. Just drink that. It's a good place to start. I'll, I'll remind, I want to remind people that are watching or listening to this that there are 7.7 .7 billion people on the planet and 48% of them don't have running water. So worst case, we're doing re your worst day is the best day ever to somebody in one of those places. We're really doing OK. Yeah. Thank you. That's an important reminder for many of us. Right. Yeah. It helps to uh, perhaps shift the perspective of some of those stressors, as you said, kind of the first phase uh, of this work um, is to uh, to shift the perspective on what actually is threatening. Uh, to us and what is simply a story that we're telling ourselves. I agree that that's number one. And as you said, drinking more water, more sleep. You mentioned sugar. So a lot of people have heard that, right? You shouldn't have a lot of sugar. What, what's the problem with sugar, really? Well, 
so drinkable sugar is going to be a problem because it's out of context, right? If I if I go out here, I can go anywhere. I can just point out here to anywhere where you live, anywhere where anyone lives and go go find liquid sugar outside because it doesn't exist in nature. It never has. Drinkable sugar for humans is non-existent. And people think, well, honey, no, honey is a chewable product in nature. If you're going to risk your life to go get it, you're going to eat that honeycomb that's surrounding that honey. And that involves chewing. And maple syrup, for those that don't know, does not come out as syrup. It comes out as water and you have to boil it. It's a 40 to one ratio. So that is actually an electrolyte water coming out of that tree, not a drinkable sugar, radically different. Uh, so maple syrup is a boiled product. So when we look at that and we look at, all right, so what should we be doing for sugars? Well, if you live in a sunny, warm place, you're going to eat sugar most of the time because all carbohydrates break down into sugar. It's one of your body's primary fuel sources is sugar. But if it's chewable, it's in context, right? You're not going to overeat carrots. It's impossible. And carrots are super high in sugar. Very. Uh, beets. If you look at how we make table sugar, sugar beets is one of the primary plants we use to make table sugar. Super high in fiber. So when I love this because this thing, this rock that we're sitting on right now, we're hurtling through space at 67,000 miles an hour, traveling, chasing a star in a convertible. And this rock has been doing math for 4 billion years. She's got it figured out, right? If she gave you sugar, she made you chew it. And the more sugar that's in one of the things out here, the more you have to chew it. So I don't like the whole, well, I can't have sugar. Yeah, you can, as long as it's got fiber and water and chewing in the appropriate amounts based on where you find it. One of the downfalls of doing videos outside is sometimes the bees come over and that makes me <laughs> If you guys can't see it, there was a bee just traveling over here trying to say hi in a polite <laughs> manner. As long as it used the front end and not the back end, I'm okay with it, right? You so, spoke its language. You talked about honey, so you invited it right in. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. maybe that's what it was. I didn't even think about that. They're like, what? Did you talk about me? I got some for you. <laughs> Come on. Uh, so here's how we do food, you guys. This is so simple because all of nature's calories regulate for you. You don't have to count anything if you're eating one of her foods. So we primarily lean into the plant world when they're available where you live because they are incredibly easy to sneak up on and you're pathetically slow. So if there's plants in Minnesota in the summer, you should eat those, right? I tell people spend more money at the farmer's market than you do at the grocery store. You're going to do a lot better for your body that way. All nature's calories self-regulate because of where she puts fiber in the plant. So when you're eating a sugar, fiber, water, and chewing, and the plants come in five categories, they are fruits, vegetables, and legumes, and then the nuts and the seeds. And I like the nuts and seeds, but if I'm going to bring them home, if I'm going to buy those at the store, I better make sure there's a shell on them still, because that is a really good way to regulate caloric intake, is to have them in the shell when they're in my house. It's going to be hard to overeat walnuts if they're in the shell compared to honey roasted peanuts that are just sitting there in a big giant clump, right? So if I'm bringing, well, peanuts would be a legume, but honey roasted cashews then, right? So nuts and seeds need to be in their shell and everything else, just if it's at the grocery store and it looks like you could find it in the garden, you should put it in your grocery cart. You can eat that whenever you want, however much you want. You don't have to count anything because you can't over consume those foods because fiber will get in your way before you do. And then you can eat the animals. When there's no plants, you eat the animals. All the animals and the eggs of those animals. Everything is on the menu. Let's go. I, I'm so tired of the, the reality of people telling us in the health industry that if you eat animals, you're hurting yourself. Well, what do you tell somebody living in Northern Iceland? That they should never eat animals? They will starve to death and die if they wait for peaches. They live in Northern Iceland. There's no peaches in Northern Iceland. And if we have to transport them up there, we've done worse things for our carbon footprint than if they just go get some fatty fish out of the ocean or hunt a caribou that are living up in that area. So the rule is this, and, and animals are okay because you don't have to count those either because protein fills you up the fastest. Protein fills you up very, very quickly, keeps you fuller longer, whether that protein is coming from legumes or, or the hemp seeds or chia seeds or you know one of the seed families or whether that protein is coming from eating an egg. We eat the animals and the plants in a local manner, in a seasonal manner, as organic as our pocketbook will allow. We don't have to be organic, but we should if we can afford it. 
because that's a vote for less chemicals. And the more of us that can't afford organic that buy it, the cheaper the price becomes for those that can't. So local seasonal organic, plants when available, animals when there's no plants. We always prioritize the plants because it they're easier on us. It's easier to catch. It's, it's easier for us to, for, for some folks to digest that stuff. So plants and animals, local seasonal organic. And then you never have to count anything. And then on occasion, once or twice a month, you go have pizza and stop feeling guilty for it. So you still get brownies, which your Colorado listeners will go, yay, because that means something way different, brownies in Colorado. <laughs> Right. So but you get those things. You get to go to Auntie Annie's pretzels when you're at the Chicago airport and have the pretzel dogs. You just can't do that every weekend because your ability to say no and your willpower when it comes to foods like that, forget it. You'll fail. And then you feel guilty. And the sad part about this is we live in a society. Guys, I'm going to give you a global statistic here because it's scary. Eight million human beings are going to starve to death this year. Most of them are kids. Eight million. That's four times more than ever died of the coronavirus are going to die this year of not having food. And you have a pizza and you feel bad about it. And think of how broken that relationship is with food. So what I want to do is there is no bad food. I'm going to give you permission to have any food you want. If you're winning, you're eating. If you're eating, you're winning. You did it. You made it. Congratulations. You're not going to starve to death today. Stop feeling bad about it. However, if food is a problem for you, I'm going to ask you where your tribal support is. And how can you change your environment of food so that you don't have pizza sitting in the freezer waiting for you to get home and put it in the oven? Change the environment to make it hard to have those things that might be a problem. Put the plants and the animals in the house. Save the pizza for once a month or twice. You can do it twice a month. You're going to be okay, right? That's when we have the French fries and the soda and whatever else you want to do there. The rest of the time, if we can control the environment, if we can change that food environment as best we can, we don't have to be perfect, guys. Start with one tiny little thing. Maybe take ice cream out of the freezer. Maybe that's the tiny thing. <clears throat> and then maybe that helps you lose five pounds this month. And maybe with that five pound weight loss, you feel energized enough to start working out more. And then you sleep better because you started working out more. And it all started because you threw ice cream out of the freezer. And now you have to go all the way down to the ice cream shop to get it. And that's two miles away and it's cold outside and you're not going to do that. Tiny changes, make them a habit and then make another tiny change. Food is, food should be easy. For my great grandparents, they were farmers in North Dakota. It was easy. It was all out there. You ate what you had in the field. If it wasn't out there, you didn't eat. So they'd grow a diverse garden and they'd have some animals out there and some chickens with eggs. Pretty easy. That was just two generations ago in my family. And now here I am with a fridge full of food. And, I, and if I don't like the food of wherever I'm at, I just grab my magic flat piece of glass and I put a bunch of numbers and buttons and all of a sudden Uber Eats brings me Indian food in the middle of Minnesota. How amazing is that? I just have to be careful how many times, well, Indian food is all on the list, right? Except the deep fried stuff. Most of the food from that culture is I'm a thumbs up with, except the stuff they're deep frying. Yeah. How's that? Easy? Uh, it is easy uh, in that sense. Or I should say it's simple, but may not be easy. What is potentially more easy is those tiny changes. And what we know from research is that's how habits are formed. Yes, the sustainable behavioral changes. That's how we do it. Yeah. And, and I think that the tribal support is really important too. You know, sometimes you've got somebody who, let's say, attends a training, let's say with you or reads a book or listens to a podcast like we're doing today. And they say, all right, I'm making this decision. This is a priority now in my life. And then, you know, they have their partner or their kids or somebody else saying, what'd you do with the ice cream in the freezer, right? Or, you know, here's the pizza, right? You come home from work, you're tired and it's right there and you're smelling it and you're, you know, you're drooling. It's harder to make the decisions at that point. So what do you do when everybody in the tribe is not quite along for the ride with you? Yeah, you take them along. Uh, like this, look, I can't be, uh, even with my knowledge, with my knowledge on food, if, if I step into the house and there's all deep fried stuff. There's all Cheez-Its and Oreo crackers and goldfish crackers and all that tasty, delicious nonsense. If that's all that's in the house, I'll fail. And I do this for a job. I will still fail because the environment is not conducive to me winning. So when somebody wants to go on a journey, if they're going alone, good luck. 
I, there's nothing I or any other health coach or any other magic app on your phone is going to be able to do for you. If the environment is not conducive to change, change doesn't happen. It just doesn't. That's why all diets fail. 97% failure on diets in five years or less. Most of them don't even last four months. It's because people won't change that home environment. Uh, eliminate the goldfish crackers. Your children are not designed to eat processed grains either, nor are you. So if everyone's not on board, plan on failure. We have to change the environment and then we have to have the tribe supporting us. We can't have, you know, if a gal is trying to lose 40 pounds and her husband doesn't need to lose weight and he's eating pizza and making fun of her for eating a salad, that's not, it's never going to work. So one way or another, we have to ask for tribal support and say, baby, trying to do some awesome things for my body. Will you please help me? I need your support. And we should be able to get that from our tribe. That's what they're for. And if they're not, there's nothing I or any other coach on the planet is going to be able to do for that person because they're not getting that tribal support where necessary. And I would say that would just be mean. If one of my tribe members came to me and said, dude, I need your help. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. That'd be the meanest thing ever for me to say. So maybe it's how we approach the tribe. Say, I, I really need your support. I desperately need your help. Can we do this, please? Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I think it's a really important part of this conversation. The other piece that I'm curious about is movement, right? You brought up yeah. exercise, you know, I'm thinking about your grandparents, you know, on that farm, right? Not only did they right, eat that food, they put it there and they worked with it, right? They got their hands dirty, so to speak. What, what can you tell us about kind of best practices with movement in this busy world? Yeah, I think too many of us are focused on how we're, how we're going to get to the gym. Like, and, and I'll, I'll plug my gym. We go to Lifetime Fitness. It's the most amazing gym on the planet. I mean, rooftop pool, uh, the world-class trainers. I love it. I mean, if you got a Lifetime Fitness nearby, go. It's amazing. But I, I don't make it there every day, especially when I'm on the road. I, I do 100 events a year. I speak 100 times a year all around the, the globe. Hey, the last two years has been pretty much just domestic, uh, but otherwise I'm, I'm global and I do a hundred speaking events a year. I can't always make it to my gym. So on the days where I can't, I still have to remind myself one of the immutable rules out here in nature is if you don't move, you don't eat. That's how it's worked in nature for 4 billion years for every animal. No movement, no food. Sorry. As a matter of fact, for humans, if you don't move, you're on the menu. So if you don't move, you get eaten. That's just how that works out there too. But let me tell you how you're programmed so you can understand how hard this is. Okay, humans and most animals are programmed to only do two things. There's two biological boxes that must be checked. We have a giant drive to these things. Biological box number one is stay alive at all costs. Self-preservation, stay alive. So eat enough food, find enough shelter, make sure you're safe. That's number one. That's why we're so fearful of things that are, could be deadly, like public speaking or heights or snakes, right? We're fearful of that because it might violate rule one. Rule two, make new people. That's it. That's all of the boxes. There are only two. Uh, make new people and stay alive so you can make new people. That's it. Once an animal has checked those two boxes or has the ability to check those two boxes, it becomes incredibly lazy. Conserve energy. There might be a predator. You might have to defend that first rule, right? Stay alive. So you got to, this is why you don't see lions doing CrossFit. This is why you don't see groups of deer with, with little leg warmers on going for a jog together, practicing jogging. You don't see it. In nature, it's eat and stay alive and then make new animal. That's it. That's us, that my grandparents were the same way. You move enough that the crops are safe and the animals are safe. And then you just chill out, man, because you just moved all day to make sure those things happen. So conserve energy and relax and then make new people. My grandparents had 16 children, so they did that one really well. OK, so, well, they're farmers in North Dakota. You got to make the farmers. That's just how that worked. Helps the farm operate better. And they were also uh, deeply religious. And that was one of those things that goes along with that as well. So here's the deal. I'm an animal that's always got food available. And when my wife is home and she's willing, I can always practice box number two. I've always got box one and two checked. So yeah, I'm going to be kind of lazy and just want to sit down. So until I shift my mentality of I don't get to eat yet, I haven't moved yet. I shouldn't be eating. I haven't done enough movement. 
I have to tie those things together. I have to switch the way they work. A lot of people think you got to eat to fuel your body. And then they have 40 pounds of fat hanging off of them, which is just stored fuel. That's nothing more. It's just stored fuel. We've eaten too much. It's just hanging out there waiting to get burned. And we're told you got to keep eating. Well, how about just stop eating until you've moved a bunch? And here's how we do movement. 10,000 steps a day is a really good number. I like that. It was a made up number by a marketing company in 1960 Japan. There's no clinical evidence behind it at all, but I like it because the average American moves 3,000 steps a day. And if I can triple that, I can triple the amount of calories they're burning. And if I can do that, I can lose weight. I can get weight off of people that have been stuck. So here's the rule. Stand more. When you're standing, you're burning more calories. You're taking pressure off your lower back muscles. You're more productive. You're less likely to snack when you're in a standing position than when you're in a seated position. And if you're working at a desk all day, simply get one that gives you the ability to stand. And when you stand, you do better. And that's where we get the movement. Because when we're standing, we don't just stand still. We're always shifting back and forth. We're always slightly adjusting things. And that's going to help with calorie burn. So my suggestion is when you're at work, if you are a seated worker, ask your employer to get you a standing desk option. Those The very desks are only $150. So for $150, I want you to stand up for half an hour and then sit down for half an hour and then stand up for half an hour and then sit down for a half an hour. Because by the time you're done with an eight hour workday, you will have gotten almost 6,000, 7,000 steps in. It's that simple. We're making it too difficult. Then on occasion, right? I call those foraging strategies because they're slow. Nobody's counting how fast you're moving. Just go slow, stand up more, walk around more. You're going to be great. When you're done at the end of the day, make sure your Apple Watch says 10,000 steps or whatever, right? Close the ring. If you're competitive, do it early. And then on occasion, we go do a hunting type exercise. And if people don't know what hunting looks like, just watch your four-year-old play outside. That's hunting. (laughs) Burst, rest, burst, rest. Uh, Sometimes a little bit of violence if you're watching boys play outside. So bursting exercise sessions, we now call that high-intensity interval training or Tabata workouts after Dr. Izumi Tabata from Japan. Sprinkle in two or three of those a week if you're able. If you're able, the weight loss happens in the foraging. The, the better vasculature and the better cardiorespiratory response and, and some of the other awesome hormones that come with inducing even some neuron growth in the brain, those happen when you're ready. If you're able, you do two or three sessions a week of, of high intensity interval training. I would suggest if you don't want to go find lifetime fitness and go to the drip class, which you can imagine how you're done when you're done with drip. <laughs> You're drippy, uh, or go to a spin class that does that. If you can't afford that, or you don't have anything like that locally, get a, get a one or two kettlebells in the house, find a, somebody to show you how to use them and just do some kettlebell workouts. But I will tell you this, if you want to be successful in those hunting style interval training workouts, get a group and do it with a group because they're, they hurt, they're painful. They're going to be very, very difficult during the process. And what humans are designed for is any other animals designed for avoid pain. So when we're doing something that we know is going to be stressful or painful on our muscles and on our cardiorespiratory system, if we do this in a group, we are much more successful at it and we do better during the exercise. And, and most folks listening and watching can admit when you go to a class, you do more work than when you're trying to do it in your basement at home. So get a group and go hunting two or three times a week. And that can be racquetball is, is nothing more than a, a glorified form of moving fast and stopping and moving fast. It's hunting. Basketball can be like that. Pickleball, if you got the right partner on the other side of that thing, right? So there's a lot of things that we can do that that mimic this. We just have to go do those. And, and if they're, we get sweaty and hot and gross, good. You did it right. So Dan, what's the biggest objection that you get uh, when you're out there sharing this message with people? Yeah, well, this is interesting it, because the biggest objection I get is, well, I'm not doing so bad. It, 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 people don't want to be honest enough with themselves to realize actually where they're at and be truthful. And it, it's because like when I go, if I go look at mainstream media, which I don't look at because I, I, I'm the guy that drives and my brain doesn't even see the billboards. Like my wife will go, oh, look at that billboard. I'm like, I, I don't even see them. I don't want to. I just, I'm not tuned to that frequency, if you will. 
But most mainstream media is going to tell you if you're 40 pounds overweight, it's fine. Just love yourself. That's all that matters. Like, yeah, 40 pounds. I don't know if you're 290 and you're 40 pounds overweight, maybe if I'm 155 and I get gain 40 pounds of fat, I'm at risk of dying of a cardiovascular disease or stroke like very, very early. So it's a big deal. And I think we're a society that just celebrates mediocrity. And when I tell people you don't want to be average, like don't look at what the average 51 year old male should look like, because average in this country keeps getting worse and worse and worse. So what we have to do is go, well, what is optimized look like? I want to be a 51 year old athlete, even though my athletic event is going to be going to the office every day. I want to be fit and healthy and strong because these bodies are supposed to last us at least 100 years. Everyone should be dying like Betty White. People forget that. 99 years old, she died in her sleep. That's how everyone should be dying. It's called old age or multi-system organ failure. That's what we should be dying from. And we're not. And it's because we're just tolerating. First of all, social pressure works. Stop tolerating it. Stop hanging out with people that drink and smoke and celebrate how unhealthy they are. Go find a different tribe that celebrates being fit and healthy and strong and being happy because those all go, the brain and the body are not separate. They're the same unit. When this thing is healthy, the thing driving it is healthier. That's in most cases, that's how it works. So stop celebrating mediocrity. Stop tolerating mediocrity and go do better. And I think that's the biggest push I get is I'm not that bad. Yeah, yeah, you are. You're that bad. <laughs> so if you guys be honest with yourself, that's what I'm saying. Look in the mirror. I, I look at myself and go, I got to make some changes. I just had a metabolic test done a couple of weeks ago. I got three months of nonsense I'm putting myself through because I didn't like the numbers, right? And I do this for a living and I was letting things slip. Stop it. Stop letting things slip to the point where like, oh, there's nothing I can do now. There's a lot you can do now. There's a lot. Get the tribe involved. Be honest with yourself and stop tolerating 60% as okay. Let's give it at least 95. And then you find everything else gets better. More energy, better relationships, more productivity, a raise, a promotion. Those all happen when you start paying attention and making this thing incrementally better each day. Uh, just tiny movements each day at the end of the year is 365 mm -hmm. awesome tiny movements added together. That's the biggest push I get is I'm not that bad. Everyone else around me looks like this too. So what am I going to do? Well, thank you for that brilliant response. I think many of us needed to hear that you know, yeah. it's a little shake that is like, wake up people. Yeah. I mean, that's that temporary motivation. That's that spark that people maybe need to go start taking the actions you got to design the environment. I, I love BJ Fogg's work at, at Stanford, oh, yeah. What Makes Habits, right? His book, if you're interested, uh, one of my favorite books for my CEO clients is called Tiny Habits. Brilliant book to read. Uh, that should be mandatory on a reading list if you're an executive. But he'll tell you, you to change a behavior, you need motivation and action and a prompt. I'm the prompt. <laughs> hey, you go get that action and make sure that that... that environment it makes the motivation easier let's go i'm nothing more than the prompt let's go change some behaviors okay i'm the guy shaking you <laughs> nothing with this site then this meant nothing and so i look at it this way he talks about uh, a prompt and i talk about the universe whispering to you i'm the universe whispering don't wait till you hear the screaming because those are never good and the screaming for most people is their first heart attack I'm the whisper. Listen now. This is just another whisper to start paying attention so that you don't have to hear the screaming later. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Well, Dan, I could sit with you for another, as you said, 11 hours at least, yeah. right, to, to talk about this stuff. I so appreciate the simplicity of the message uh, because I think we get bombarded with so much research and opinions and oftentimes they're conflicting and it just, it brings confusion and where there's confusion, there is no action, right? Yeah. So thank you once again. How can people learn uh, about your awesome programs, your workshops? I know you do really good work. 
how can we find out about that? Yeah, everything I have is on my website, including my social links. They're all on there. So it's just danmillerwellness.com. And just, just remember, you guys, there's two magic words in getting healthy. Are you ready for them? They're, these are magic words. And these were told to me by a 78-year-old gentleman who had reversed his own diabetes in six months. So at 78, statistically speaking, he should have been dead already, right? Males in this country don't live to 78 on average, statistically speaking. Some do, but the average male death is younger than that. And this guy went into his doctor with diabetes at 78. And in six months, he went back and he had no more diabetes. And let me tell you what he told me. I said, what did you do to do that? Because I'm always curious. And he said, I paid attention. So there's your magic words. Start paying attention. That's all you have to do because we all know pizza and French fries aren't healthy. How often are you eating them? Pay attention. Write some stuff down. Just pay attention. And if you can start, if you can start with even just drinking more water or getting an extra hour of sleep, the spiral starts self-accelerating in an upward direction because more sleep is going to lead to more energy, is going to lead to better weight loss, is going to lead to all the other stuff. When we're when we're fit and healthy, we have less stress. That's fairly natural in most cases. Start the spiral by starting somewhere and just pay attention. I love it, that upward momentum, if you will. And so, Dan, with all my heart, thank you for sharing this message with our world. We need it so much. I know you know, especially these days. Um, and this is the time to make those changes. So, so thank you again. And I'm excited for people to reach out to you and learn more about how to do this for themselves. I appreciate you. Thank you.